And good afternoon. This is Pushing Limits radio program, and today I am the host, and my name is Eddie Ituarte. Pushing Limits is the program dedicated to the wide, varied disability communities about our issues, about our struggles, about our culture, and sometimes about our fun, and sometimes about things that are not so fun. And uh, that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about today, something not too much fun. It's the institutionalization of people with disabilities. We're going to get a little bit into the history of it, the background um, in this half hour from 2 to 2.30 to 3 o'clock here on KPFA in Berkeley. Um, and we have as our guest, Gabrielle Stangis, who is uh, who has a, a, a student at the uh, Honors College and in, in Oakland University. That's Oakland University in Michigan. She wrote a paper called uh, Places of Such Towering Misery, the History of the Institutional institutionalization and the institutionalization of people with disabilities. Um, that's a, kind of a word that um, um, uh, it presents a little bit of difficulty, but, but we know what we're talking about. We're talking about people in institutions and, and uh, how they got there and why they sometimes they shouldn't be there. Uh, and Gabrielle, is, uh, she's a student and writer now, and she is attending uh, Wayne State University after uh, writing that paper at the Honors College at uh, Oakland University in Michigan. Welcome, Gabrielle Stanges. Hello. Thanks, thanks for having me. And is that the correct pronunciation of your name, please? Um, my last name is actually pronounced Stangis. Okay, and by the way, it's S-T-A-N-G-I-S. And the paper is actually that Gabrielle uh, uh, wrote. It's pretty uh, easy to um, read if you want to uh, re- uh, uh, get onto it after, after this program. Um, and uh, Okay, so Gabrielle, I'm, I'm, first of all, uh, why would, uh, what was your interest in writing this paper with this particular topic? Um, well, I, I was a history major, so when it came to um, picking a topic for my thesis, um, I wanted to write about something to do with history, and um, I've always been interested in disability history, and um, my um, my first year of college, I read um, the, the book by Kim Nielsen, of People's um, History, uh, it's about disability history in America, and, and there, it talked a little bit about institutions. And I just wanted to learn more about that. So that's why I decided to write my paper about that. Now, and, as, as I understand, people up until around the 1840s, they were generally people with disabilities. If they were take, kept, uh, if there was any care for them, it was gradually by families or, or in towns. Um, but even before then, uh, uh, as I recall, there was almhouses and, and, and debtor prisons, I, th- I think, in the colonies in the United States. Um, but these weren't specifically dedicated then to people with disabilities before uh, r- around the 1840s. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, yeah. Poor houses. Anyone could be sent to a poor house. It was for, like, d- d- disabled people were sent there as well as poor people or criminals or people who weren't able to support themselves. And some some disabled people um, did live with their families, especially if the families were wealthy and could take care of them. Um, and some disabled people worked themselves, but the ones who didn't have anyone to support them and they couldn't support themselves, they were usually sent to poor houses, which were very overcrowded and uh, and dangerous. And then around the 1840s, a couple of names, uh, uh, fairly prominent now, uh, they came up. And those people are Dorothea Dix, and the spelling is D-I-X, the last name, and also Samuel uh, Gridley Howe. Can you talk a lo- little bit about these individuals? Yeah. Um, Dorothea, Dorothea Dix was a teacher. She mostly taught um, young children, and um, when she she um, became interested in advocating um, for better treatment for disabled people after she visited um, a Massachusetts House of Corrections, and she saw how bad the living conditions were. So she 
began to, she traveled all, all over the country um, observing what the conditions were and speaking out about reform for that. And um, Samuel Gurley Howe was a doctor, and he was a social reformer for lots of causes, including abolition. And he, um, he established a school for the blind called the Perkins School for the Blind. And he also, also in 1948, he established um, the Massachusetts School for Idiotic and Feeble-Minded Youth, which was meant to um, prepare students to live and work with the rest of society. Um, and Dorothy Dix um, supported this as well. And the, what institutions were like back, or what they wanted them to be like, what, what they were hoping they would be like, were meant to care for, care for disabled people and to help them, um, help educate them and help them find jobs and return to their communities. And, initial, and initially these training schools like that they they were successful in that way, but um, they but it was hard for people to find jobs because during the middle of the 1800s the economy was struggling because of the aftermath of the Civil War, um, so it was hard for anyone to find jobs. And but uh, despite that, um, parents kept sending their children to these schools, and these schools eventually didn't have the, um, the ability to educate everyone, so they transitioned into, be, into becoming just like custodial centers for disabled people, and there was no education, or if it was, they were just um, only taught simple skills that they could use as laborers in the schools. Mm. Um, and um, and Dorothea Dixon and Samuel Gridley Howe helped to establish over... Um, thirty-two public institutions. Thirty-two. Yes. Um, so actually, that was quite a bit compared to basically zero before those two folks started organizing mm-hmm. this work. Um, yeah. I think you had mentioned, though, uh, if I did, if I recall, uh, that something about uh, what one of the school's names was for feeble-minded. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. That was. Uh-huh. Yeah. Go on. No, that sounds like uh, well, it sounds like it's it, it it's geared to people with m- mental re- retardation and intellectually challenged folks, uh, and not necessarily for blind or or people with disabilities. Uh, was it that because of that particular name? Yeah, yeah. If you were minded at the time, we would refer to people that we would call having intellectual disabilities today, um, like. One thing, like I noticed during my research for the paper, is that like the spectrum of institutions um, was was very broad as as disability is. So there's a, there's a lot of variety in what they were like. Um, schools for the, there were schools for the blind and for the deaf that taught sign language and and braille, and then and there are also institutions for um, people with intellectual di- disabilities. And mental illnesses. Were many of these schools toward the later part of the 19th century uh, geared toward training people to do menial jobs, or or what was their purpose? If you could uh, sort of uh, summarize what their purpose was. Yeah, the, yeah. The purpose was to educate, um, to educate, educate them, and to help, and to provide training for jobs. And, but these would have been what I would call menial jobs of uh, uh, house cl- cleaning uh, or what or or certain or even jobs that would require some degree of, of college or, or what. Um, it would depend um, on the exact school, I would think. Um, but I, I think I think for the most part, it was. Um, Jobs that wouldn't require um, a college education. Yeah. Now, at that time, there was no. Would you say there was no thought at all that that people with disabilities themselves should run these institutions, should be on their boards and be their executive directors? It was the. the 
what what was happening at this time before the 20th century was that these that any of these institutions were run by people that did not have disabilities is that a correct generalization yeah yeah that's right um at, um i know it's in some schools for the deaf um some some teachers were deaf but 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 for the most part the schools and institutions were run by people without disabilities Okay, and then moving on close uh, l- later on to around the 20th century, around the turn, um, when did electric shock, electroshock treatments come into use? Yeah, um, it was first used, um, it, um, it was developed in the 1930s in Italy, and then it became used in America um, soon after that. It, and it was used by doctors, some 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 of them believed that it, it that it could treat mental illness, um, and others just used it as a way to um, con- control patients. Okay, and around that time too, uh, we have the the uh, the eugenics movement. Um, yeah. Was that? Uh, did that play into a factor in the way these some of these institutions w- were run? Yeah, yeah. Um, with the idea of eugenics, um, it was the belief that um, that like so-called un- undesirable char- characteristics could be breeded out from people, um, and that these characteristics weren't um, a good thing, so obviously. And that effect that really affected the way people saw disabled people. They were see, they were seen as they should be um, separated from society and and not allowed or encouraged to um, have children. Lots of um, like tens of thousands of people were, were sterilized to prevent that from happening as a way of um, out of like a misguided belief to to eradicate disability. Um, over seventy thousand um, people people were sterilized because of that. Okay, and do you have any idea of the seventy thousand? How many were people of color, particularly b- black people, black women? I don't know. I, I I I don't know about any statistics, but I do know that they were disproportionately affected by this. Okay. Um, and I guess I would have, yeah, I guess I would have involved in sterilizing men also. Um, because in some ways oh, it's yeah. easier to steal oh, these yeah. men than women. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. That happened as well. Um, I don't know exactly how many men were sterilized in comparison to women, but it affected both genders. Yeah. Um, another thing related to to this these kind of developments, the because it seems like some of these institutions, to me, even during the earlier part of the century, where we're talking about sterilizations and and electroshock. Um, how about lobotomies? When when does that come into the picture, and, and has that been a widely used procedure on people, no matter what their disabilities are? Lobotomies. Yeah, um, they were first performed in the late 1880s in Switzerland, um, but they didn't become like popular, especially in America, until around 1935. And in America, um, around 50,000 people were lobotomized, and many of them were um, given lobotomies without being informed of, about the procedure. They didn't even know what was happening until after it had happened. And would you say mostly p- poor people are affected or people from all classes, all income levels? In these institutions, in institutions, um, I'm not sure, but I think people who were poor would have had less um, ability to, ability to protect themselves. And I know poor families often sent their children to institutions because they weren't able to care for the the children at home, even if they wanted to. Another uh, problem that comes up is that during all this time is that people that weren't really disabled got caught up in, go- in being institutionalized. Um, do you have an idea as to what, uh, how that worked out? What extent was it? Um, did it work particularly against women? Yeah, yeah. A lot of the people who were institutionalized were just in- institutionalized because they were poor or they committed a crime or if they were um, an orphan. 
and some people some people were especially women were also declared to be insane by the courts by society and then institutionalized as a way to control them um men had had the ability to legally institution institutionalize their wives um and just to declare them insane um one of the women this happened to was Elizabeth Packard, who um, in 18, 1860, her husband had her institutionalized because he, because he believed that her religious beliefs were dangerous to the children, to, to their children, and she eventually and she spoke out about this and demanded her freedom. And eventually, she was found to be sane by a jury after spending um, four years in an institution. Hmm. Um, we're talking to Gabrielle Stangis, who is a student now at the Wayne State University uh, in Michigan. Uh, Wayne State is in Michigan, right? Yes. Yeah, and she wrote a, a paper that's pretty easily available uh, called Places of Such Towering Misery, the History of the Institutional Institutional." and deinstitutionalization of, of disabled. Um, now how about, is there some positive experiences that happened, um, though, in, in institutions uh, uh, like, the I guess, around the 30s, 1930s, 1940s, 1930s, I guess, uh, the uh, Roosevelt Warm Springs? Yeah, yeah, there were really some positive experiences, Um because there's a spectrum of what institutions were like for so broad. Um, and yeah, the, the Ro- um, Roosevelt Warm Springs was a rehabilitation center for people with physical disabilities. Um, it was founded by Franklin Roosevelt, and it was originally founded to treat polio survivors. Um, and then it um, grew to support people with all kinds of physical disabilities. Um, and, um, the, and the center um, employed polio survivors and other disabled people on its staff, and that was a very positive thing for the people um, who who were patients there because it allowed them to see that that today with people could have all kinds of all kinds of careers and do lots of things. And that was located in Atlanta, Georgia. Yes. Is it still it folded though, didn't it, or what? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that was I thought was really cool about some of these institutions, the positive ones like Roosevelt, Mm -hmm. is that for maybe perhaps for the first time, people with uh, disabilities um, got to know each other, uh, uh, talked about their disabilities, knew they got to know other people with disabilities for the first time by, you know, even myself uh, in in my mid-77, I didn't really have much of a a contact with other people with disabilities through much of my life, Um, but it seems like these institutions would have been real uh, helpful for that and getting people together and and discovering what their disability meant. Uh, So it seemed that was one one positive element of some of these uh, a good, better institutions, the good institutions. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, there was that, there was a, a a really good thing about some of them. Um, and, um, you know, it's it's cool for the deaf um, that this, the deaf students were able to communicate in sign language with their students, and for a lot of um, communicate with their classmates who were also deaf. Um, and for a lot of them, that was the first time they had the chance to use sign language because the, because the families didn't sign. So that was a very positive thing for them. Now, much of your paper um, talks about the various forms of abuse. And mm-hmm. uh, we th- these programs last so, last so quick that we, we can't really get into it. But could you talk about some of the forms of abuse, like physical abuse as practiced at, in the past at Willowbrook uh, State School in New York or Lima State Hospital. Uh, what's some ways that people were physically abused by their uh, by people around these institutions? Yeah, yeah, the physical abuse was very was, was very common and very awful. Um, and, and at Willowbrook, um, a patient was actually statistically more likely to be um, assaulted, raped, or murdered than in any neighborhood in New York City which I thought was a very shocking statistic to hear. Um, 
And a lot of the times when the when the when the, when the patients were abused, the, pa- the the staff and the doctors wouldn't care, or it was the doctors who were doing the abusing. Uh, and there are instances instances at at Willowbrook where, where the where the doctors would tell tell some patients to to to, to abuse other patients um, as just a way of harming them. And there is also um, abuse, um, medical abuse with medical experiments. Um, and at Willowbrook, um, some of the doctors gave the patients. Um, Hepatitis A in order to um, study how to develop a, a hepatitis vaccine. So there was a lot of abuse, and there was n- very little um, regulation um, t- t- to protect the people who were in the institutions. And these guys got away with stuff like that. Yeah, there are some. There, there are some doctors um, who, tr- who, tr- who who tried to who tried to. Um, Topless and raise awareness. Um, at Willowbrook, there was a doctor, um, William Bronson, who became um, a, an advocate for people with disabilities and for deinstitutionalization. So a lot of information about Willowbrook um, comes came from him. But yeah, but a, a lot. Yeah, but a lot of the doctors and the staff of the institutions um, didn't care. Okay, and there was also sexual abuse uh, in some of these places, like uh, Empire State School. Yeah, yeah, it was very um, one and one um, story I, I I remember reading about was that um, there was um, a, um, someone at the institution was recounting how he had how he heard that. Um, Someone's family members had heard that he was being abused, and the reaction of this person was basically, I don't know why they're getting so upset because this happens all the time, you know. So it, it was very common for for the patients to be abused by the staff and also sometimes by each other, and there was literal protection from that. And also, you also talk about the problem of racism, which um, unfortunately we don't really have that time to get into too much of those things. But the one thing that really stood out uh, was something like the Hiawatha Asylum for Insane Indians. Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. Yeah, that was um, an institution that was created just for Native Americans. Um, It was written... um, it was only for Native Americans, and it was, it was speculate. It was one of the, one of the few federal and federal um, asylums, and it was speculated that it was established just to be able to control Native Americans, to take them from their families and cultures. Um, and a lot of the abuse that they experienced there was motivated by racism. Um, they were forced to cut their hair, and they weren't able to speak their native languages. And things like that. And is that pro- program still around? Hopefully not. <laughs> I don't think so. No. Okay. Okay, but uh, in the last few minutes, uh, there's been all kinds, all forms of uh, a lot of different forms about organizing. Of course, we had uh, the independent living uh, movement in the '70s. Um, uh, that was prominent in Berkeley and New York City. Uh, so there's certainly been organizing on a lot of different ways uh, that people in the disability community have organized in different uh, issues. And there has been quite a bit of organizing around uh, 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 stopping or 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 reforming some of these institutions for people with disabilities and uh, uh, in, in this country. Um, generally speaking, do you feel that because of the organizing that some of these institutions have either stopped or gone away because of the pressure? Uh, has the, has the, the, the activism against the unfair uh, institutionalization of, of people with disabilities been effective, do you think? Yeah, yeah, I, I think um, I argued in my paper is that the main driving course of deinstitutionalization was the activism of disabled people. Um, 
And it happened through a few ways. Um, like, like you mentioned, the independent living movement gave um, alternatives for, for disabled people with science institutions. And many um, disabled people formed organizations specifically designed to um, bring about the institutionalization. Um, in New York City um, in the 70s, a group of formerly institutionalized people founded um, an organization called Project, Project Release, which was meant to help formerly institution, institutionalized people um, find places to live. And um, in Pennsylvania, um, a group of self-advocates um, called Speaking for Ourselves was founded in the 70s, um, and that was dedicated entirely to bringing about deinstitutionalization. Um, one of the leaders in it was a man called um, Roland Johnson, who had been institutionalized, and he um, dedicated his life to um, closing institutions. And they actually received um, a grant to allow them to visit all the institutions in Pennsylvania, and they observed the condition, uh, listened to what the residents were saying, um, and then afterwards, they testified at, hear at hearings to um, let to let the people in the government know how everyone, wa most pe most people, um, wanted the institutions to be closed. Okay, could you talk a little bit about the, the, here's the one that I really like to th something called the Network Against Psychiatric Assault, uh, which I mean that's local barrier to us. Can you talk a little bit about that organization? Yeah, yeah, it was formed, um, it was an advoca advocacy group formed by survivors of institutions. Um, it was founded in 1974 in California, and the goal was to um, change the psychiatric system, um, change the perception of mental illness, and to stop um, medical abuse under the guise of um, helping, helping people who are mentally ill. And... Um, one of the things they did was publish a magazine called um, the the Madness Network News, um, and the issues were written pr pr primarily by former patients and current patients about um, the issues in the in the in the psychiatric system. And, and they um, just in closing, though, uh, they were successful in what? Stopping the use of, uh, was it electroshock in the institutions or what? Yeah, yeah, that happened a lot. Um, and the Network Against Psychiatric Assault actually um, caused, um, they, um, caused a lot, um, banning electroshock therapy in Berkeley to be passed. Um, it was later overturned, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... So we have had a rich, rich history of, uh, of fighting back r around the activism. We could go into m much more of this, uh, mm -hmm. but we've, uh, G Gabrielle Stangis, we've run out of time. And like I said, your program, your, uh, your paper is pretty easily available. Uh, if you uh, 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 Google your name, or you just go uh, Gabrielle yeah. Stangis. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much for coming on the show. And thank you to Rada Keel, uh, our engineer, and also to uh, Josh Alwood for his assistance. Some way or somehow Cause I've got my strength And it don't make sense Not to keep on pushing Do you know about Area 94.1? KPFA's online-only collection of podcasts with a unique mix of informed public affairs, culture, and arts. KPFA has expanded its digital footprint with more on-demand programming. Special content including interviews and speeches from writers like Alice Walker, Alan Watts, and show audio collections from Hard Knock Radio, Letters and Politics, and more. Visit kpfa.org slash Area 94.1. KPFA's Area 94.1. Online only. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF, 88.1 FM in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide, worldwide, worldwide. worldwide.
at kpfa.org. Thank you.